Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to give a slightly different perspective on our DevOps transformation over the last 12 months. Um, unlike Medi's team, we didn't have a monolith. Um, we had essentially a blank slate. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the problems associated with deploying a bunch of microservices and how we solve them. So let's start. Um, who am I? Slightly more accurate picture of myself than Medi had. But, um, so I'm a systems engineer. Basically means I do DevOps, whatever that means these days. Um, I help manage our cloud infrastructure. We have a majority, um, majority of it is in AWS uh, with a sprinkling of Google Cloud. I also work with the developers to help implement um, DevOps best practices. So I've been at Telegraph for about over a year now, um, and I'm a big football fan. Uh, I support Fulham FC. For, the, for those of you who don't know anything about football, they're one of the best teams in England. <laughs> well, I don't know why you're laughing at, but sure. Um, so I work in the platform team. Um, what do we do? So I like to think the platform team sort of split into two key areas of responsibility. First is APIs. So we're in charge of developing and maintaining a set of core APIs to help, I guess, core business functions. Um, for example, everyone knows we have our content on telegraph.co.uk, but we also share that content with various other third-party platforms, such as Google um, and Facebook. So we develop the APIs to help facilitate that. Um, the other side of what we do is kind of a new thing. We call it the platform as a service. Um, and essentially what that allows us to do is open up our platform, our infrastructure, the tools we built to other teams within the organization to help them deploy applications. I will go um, a bit more into that a bit later. So our technology. I'm sure you guys recognize most of these logos. Um, a lot of overlap with what Medi had. Um, big AWS fans, big Docker fans. We containerize everything as part of our strategy. Um, we're quite language agnostic, and Docker allows that. Um, we have mainly Node and Scala, but there's a sprinkling of Python and some other languages. But again, because this Jenkins me up, I'm going to focus on how Jenkins to help helped us scale our microservices over the last four months um, and how we did that. So let's rewind. Let's start at the beginning. Essentially, it's we have a clean slate. We have nothing. We want to build a bunch of microservices. And obviously, the first thing you do is you want to figure out what is my CI CD pipeline going to look like. And this is sort of like the simplified version of how that looks for the sake of this talk. Um, but we came up with something like this. So you commit into a master repository for your application. That triggers, uh, triggers a Jenkins um, job to run. You run some unit tests to make sure we haven't broken any fundamental um, features. Um, because we dockerize and um, containerize everything, next step is to build your application, have an image you're ready to use and test against. Um, once that's done, we then use Docker Compose to basically get the image that we built in the previous step go and test it against various other third parties. It could be some mocked endpoints. It could be a database. Basically, getting a more confidence that what we're building isn't going to break anything. Once we're happy with that, and we pass the unit tests, and we build the, uh, pass the integration tests, it's time now to get the image into an environment. So first of all, to get it into an environment, we have to push it somewhere. And because we're big um, AWS fans, ECR is the logical choice there. So we push your image into ECR. And now we're ready to go. We, can, we want to deploy it into an environment and actually do some testing with how it might, might um, act. So we use Amazon ECS, which is essentially um, Amazon Elastic Container Service. And it's Amazon's orchestration layer around deploying containers, similar to Kubernetes. So we push the image that we've um, pushed into ECR into our pre-prod environment. Now we can do some smoke tests, have a look. Is everything OK? Is it acting like we expect? Once that's done, we're ready to go live. So because we're using Docker, we can just basically promote the same image that was in pre-prod into production, meaning the amount of changes that are between these environments is minimal, hopefully. Um, once that's good, when that's all done, we have our application live. We can now shout about it, because that's what we like to do. So we notify page duty, essentially, so the person on call can go and look. And, and the issues I'm getting now, due to a release that we did maybe a day before, we put it in Slack so the rest of the team can get some visibility of what's going on. And we put it in Jira, just so we have a nice audit trail of the releases that have gone out. Great. So we have our pipeline defined. Now we want to implement it. And because it's Jenkins, it makes sense to use Jenkins pipelines. Um, it's fairly common these days. Um, I guess most of you are familiar with it. If not, Jenkins pipeline is essentially a way to define your 
the stages of your pipeline um, in Jenkins, and that's done by a Jenkins file. And a Jenkins file is essentially a text file that contains um, all of the steps that you want your pipeline to consist of. And there's the declarative way of doing it, and then the other one is the scripted way. Um, both are equally valid. But you can see here, you have your stages, which is essentially um, a logical representation of what you want to do. So you have the obvious ones, such as build, test, and deploy. And because it's in a f as a file, you can store it with your application code. It can be in GitHub. You get all the benefits around pipeline as code. So you get your pull requests, you have your history. Great. OK. Um, once you give Jenkins this file, essentially it gives you a nice visualization. You get a history of all your builds, how long certain things are taking, all the good stuff. Um, and because I like to be a bit more 21st century, you can install the Blue Ocean plugin. And it gives you a nicer view on your pipeline, especially when you have parallel builds like this. Because the previous one, it's a flat structure. Great. So we have our pipeline. We're deploying to production. My job's done, right? DevOps. I can go back to reading Reddit. Not really. Um, let's fast forward. So we have our pipeline, and we've de we're deploying it. And now we're at our 20th microservice. What are some of the problems that we're facing? Um, so I like to coin the phrase microservice fatigue. So you're building a new microservice. You've written all your application code. But that's, n that's not the only thing you need to do. There's a bunch of other supporting stuff you need to do before your application go live in production. So first of all, you have to write your Docker file. You have to say, this is what my application is. This is how I want to run it. Once you've done that, you need to think about your infrastructure. Because we use Amazon mainly, it makes sense to use CloudFormation. But it's a sake, it's, it's a, you need to understand, do I need a database? Do I want some cache? And you have to basically write all that in this cloud formation. Great. So you've done these two things. Next, you have to write your Jenkins file. You have to make sure all your steps that you want are defined in your Jenkins file. Once that's done, you want to create your Docker repo so there's somewhere to push your images. And last of all, to tie it all together, you have your Jenkins <coughs> job. But doing this 21 times is quite tedious. It's quite repetitive. It's not much fun for everyone. But since we do DevOps, we can automate this, right? And that's what we did. So we created a thing called the Jenkins Pipeline Generator, which is essentially a Jenkins job that creates Jenkins jobs, plus some extra bits and bobs. Um, but the premise is this, of this is you can basically create a GitHub repo, tell the Pipeline Generator your um, organization, what your project name is. And if you're building an application of a certain language that we support, you can pick it from here. So when you click Build, behind the scenes, we do a bunch of magic. Um, so essentially, we use um, Gitterate, a templating language, to give you some base um, cloud formation. We give you a Jenkins file, um, and we give you a Docker file. And we also use the Amazon CLI to go create a Docker repo for you. And then finally, we use the Jenkins CLI or API to go create another Jenkins job for you. So at the end, oh, your empty GitHub repo turns into something like this. So you have your infrastructure, you have your Docker file, you have a Jenkins file, all the good stuff. So this is a great starting point because we try to abstract and take the most common things that we feel like all projects should have. And obviously, every project is slightly different, but it's a good starting place to have most of the stuff you want already done for you. Great. We have a conveyor belt. We can deploy the services all we want. I can go back to reading Reddit, right? No. Nearly, but not quite. So let's fast forward. We have 50 microservices now. And if we go back to our original pipeline, it's all well and good, but you know, we iterate, we change things. For the sake of argument, let's say I want to change Slack to HipChat, and instead of ECR, I want to use Docker. OK, this might be a bit difficult. We have now project 50 projects live, and I think of it a bit like this. You've let all the animals out in the zoo, and now you're trying to herd them up to make changes. So how can we solve this? So the idea that we had was we wanted all our pipelines to essentially call a shared pipeline and basically make a library that has all of the common um, aspects of our Jenkins file. And luckily for us, that exists as in Jenkins. And it's called the Global um, Pipeline Library. And essentially what it is, is you, if you go into Jenkins and go into configuration, you'll see this section. And you basically give it um, a GitHub URL. And what it does is for the clients that opt into this library, they automatically get the GitHub repo pulled when the job runs. And you can basically pass in a bunch of defined stages and methods. So as a client, I just need to put this at the top of my Jenkins file, and I get access to a bunch of stages or methods that we've basically abstracted away um, and made as a library. And there's some obvious things here, like you get CloudFormation validation, you get a validate pod deploy, stuff like that. Um, 
We also wrote a bunch of docs so the person who is building the pipeline can see what's in the shared library and see, OK, do I need this? Is it valid for me? How do I use it? Um, and some of the params. So this way, we don't have 50 copies of the same pipeline. We have the majority of the important stuff abstracted away into a common library. So something that might look like this 50 times, and obviously it's a lot of logic here. You have to kind of know what's going on. It's not always that important to know. After you implement the Jenkins Share Library, it looks something like this. So I'm sure you agree it looks much simpler. It's quite obvious what's going on. And it means if we want to make a change and swap out um, ECR for Docob, we can just do that in the central place. And that should propagate out to all of our projects. So we spent the last 12 months building all these tools. We now have our pipeline um, generator. We have our shared library. Why don't we share it out to the rest of the company? And that's what we've started to do with this platform as a service. So essentially, Telegraph operates in sort of a squad model, and there are often short-lived teams that pop up for a, a specific business purpose. So for example, we want to rebuild TV listings. Um, yes, we have TV listings. It's weird. I don't know why. Um, and essentially, it'll be a team of three to five people. And their, their purpose will be, OK, let's rebrand TV listings. But often, they won't have either operational experience, or they might not be um, familiar with infrastructure. So deploying and getting that application live takes a lot more time than it needs to be. So that's why we basically wanted to open up all our tools um, and our platform to basically allow other teams to deploy their applications into our platform. So this is relatively new. We've started to roll it out. Um, but in our production cluster, we currently have 60 plus services, um, and that's growing every day. Those 60 services span about 150 containers, but because everything's auto um, scaling, in peak times that will be higher, and in the middle that will be quite low. And the best thing is we can cram as many containers on to 25 instances, so you save money. And another benefit we give to the people who are deploying their application um, into, our, into our environment is we give them automatic metrics and logging. So you deploy your container, we give you a dashboard with some metrics, we give you a page for logging, so you can basically go and debug if your application is not working properly or you have performance issues. And it, essentially, we want to make it as self-service as possible. Um, and the best thing of this is it's all self-healing and auto-scaling. So as a consumer, if you say, I want um, a container that has 10 gigs of RAM times 20. So we will see that request, and we will automatically scale up the number of instances that need to power that. Um, likewise, if one of these instances dies, it, a new one will come to sort of take its place. So it's very light touch. We spent a lot of time automating all of the stuff that we need to make this a production-ready environment. Um, and it's, it's, so far, it's going quite well. So to recap, we started off our journey 12 months ago um, with Jenkins. We had a lot of good intentions. And as we started to increase our usage and roll out the number of microservices that we had on Jenkins, Jenkins turned into a bit of this, a bit of an unwieldy beast. But thanks to our efforts spent automating and trying to implement best practices, we feel we're Jenkins masters now. And now I can go back to reading Reddit. Thank you very much.